All right, let's go ahead and get started. People will probably trickle in as we as we get going, but I don't want to waste too much time. Um, hello and welcome to Race in the PR Classroom, um, Confronting Bias in the Classroom, presented by the Institute for Public Relations and the PRSA Educators Academy. My name is Dean Mundy and I'm the PR Director at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication and this year's Chair of the Educators Academy. Today is the sixth session in our series and today's topic dives into the topic of bias in the classroom and, and different perspectives and engaging different perspectives regarding bias in the classroom. I'd like to welcome today's hosts, Monique Farmer, Assistant Professor of Practice at the University of Nebraska, Dr. Minjong Kang, Associate Professor of Public Relations at Indiana University, and Dr. Nalanjana Barden, Professor of Public Relations and Intercultural Communication at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this is a Q&A type forum. To ask a question, you can either type it into the chat or virtually raise your hand by going to participants at the very bottom of the Zoom screen and clicking on that and selecting raise the hand function. If you'd like to ask a question anonymously, please type the message to the host in the chat and we will read your question aloud. Um, only the moderators are able to see your question if you can do that. Um, if you are tweeting about the discussion, please use the hashtag RPRC for race in the PR classroom. Um, this discussion is being recorded and will be available for playback on the IPR website. Um, we'll also send you an email when the playback is available. Um, lastly, please remain respectful to our hosts and others on the call by keeping yourself muted at all times, um, unless you intend to speak or ask a question. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our panelists, starting with, with Nalanjana. Um, and I will ask each of them just basically to, to offer your perspectives of bias in the classroom and the different issues that we need to be aware of regarding bias in the classroom. And if you have a story, uh, a specific um, example of something that elucidates um, your core points, then I would welcome you to share that. So Nalanjana, I'll just turn it over to you. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yep. Okay, go. <laughs> good way to start. <laughs> but thank you, Dean, uh, and uh, thanks to IPR and to the PRSA Educators Academy for hosting this session and also for inviting us to be on it. I uh, wanted to say that uh, first. But uh, I'll, I'll, I guess, start this off by saying that, you know, our title today for this uh, webinar is part of the larger race in the classroom. And today's um, focus is confronting bias in the classroom. And I just wanted to sort of mention here that when we say uh, bias in the confronting bias in the classroom by the term classroom we don't strictly mean just the classroom space because teaching happens in many different spaces across the campus so we mean uh, every space within the you know educational setting and on campus in the university that impacts the classroom as well so so what happens in the classroom is sort of really goes beyond the classroom and is brought back into the classroom. So things like, you know, the PRSSA session, you know, meetings that, you know, you have with your students, the hallways, the office hour meetings, you know, the Zoom sessions, and all of these things that sort of come together to create what we call the classroom. And as, you know, to these days, the classroom is Zoom, you know, so so, so we want to have a broad sense of classroom here today, I think, when we, uh, we talk about um, the classroom and confronting bias. So, um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and my teaching experience so I can sort of, you know, give you a context of, uh, you know, my story as I share them with you today. Um, I, I teach in two areas. I actually teach in public relations and this 50% of me is in that and 50% of me is sort of in, in intercultural communication. So it's been interesting experience for me all along because uh, of how bias, bias comes up in those two different classroom settings and I'm hoping there might be some uh, helpful takeaways from that comparison as well. Uh, when, um, when, um, when, when I'm in an intercultural communication class, the central topic is culture and communication. So we're sort of all more focused, you know, in the classroom on that topic and issues of bias and so on. However, when I'm in a PR classroom, uh, it's a different kind of pedagogy or teaching. It's more of a, uh, you know, we're here to talk about PR, but alongside we have to make sure we talk about other important issues related to diversity, inclusion, culture, and so on. So, so, um, it, what tends to happen in public relations classes is these things come in unless we're focusing very directly on a diversity related campaign. These things kind of uh, 
issues of bias or how people approach culture or difference happen in, in more PR related ways. For example, you know, if we we're talking about a campaign in a campaign's class, you know, there might creep in like some kind of heterosexist bias or some kind of, you know, assumptions about race or people um, or some kind of, you know, other assumptions about how people in a different country are or something. And so in, in those situations, uh, you know, I have to sort of do as an educator, my work is to try and make sure that as we're working along, you know, as I'm working with my students, I make you sort of pull these out if any assumptions come along or biases come along to try and, you know, work through them in a way that they can see their assumptions if they are making certain, you know, assumptions. In an intercultural class, that's the central topic. So it's, it's a little different uh, conversation. And I'll give you an example from, um, so one of my from one from a PR class and one from an intercultural class, a story that uh, might be helpful in terms of also what can we do in situations where a bias might arise. And and before I dive into this, I also want to say there are different situations or actors involved in a bias situation in the classroom. For instance, it might be a teacher and or between a teacher and a student, or it might be between two students. Uh, and it might be that the teacher is, uh, you know, an un, a member of an underrepresented group and the student is not, uh, is a member of the dominant uh, cultural group or vice versa. The teacher is, you know, uh, um, not a member of the, uh, of an underrepresented group and the student, um, uh, you know, is. So we have to keep all these things in mind. These are complex situations when they happen. And I think the main thing I keep in mind as a teacher when I, I, I face bias in the classroom is, people see by in a way that doesn't push them away because this is about teaching and learning. So I had a situation, um, this was around 2004, it was a spring semester class, it was an intercultural communication class and we had, uh, if, I don't know if any of you remember this, it's six years ago, but Super Bowl, they had an ad, Coca-Cola had an ad, which was uh, where America's Beautiful was sung in seven different languages and immigrants were featured, you know, in that ad and, they, and, and you had different family situations, you had, you know, same-sex couples, you had, you know, diverse couples, interracial couples, America the Beautiful being sung in seven different languages. There was some pushback on this ad after it uh, saying, you know, why does something that has is, you know, why do we have to sing it in so many different languages and why can't people just learn English? You know, that sort of thing happened. Uh, and one of my students in this class, I'll call her Katie, um, she was very, this is about halfway through the semester. She'd been really attentive and she was a white cisgender, uh, from what I could tell, you know, uh, from the class um, uh, woman who really was very engaged in the class and she's really been very participative and mindful and everything. But when I showed this one video and we talked, started talking about it, she hadn't really heard of all that stuff on the social media yet, but she was like, but why can't we keep this just in English? I mean, it's been in English all along. Why can't we just keep this in English? And she wasn't coming from a place of like, you know, I'm pushing back against this. This was really an interesting moment for me. And I said, I am a woman of color. She is a white straight student uh, who will, if I, and I'm in a position of power in a way here. So if I, how I handle this is very, going to be very important. If I say something that will silence her or tell her that's not the way to think about this, that will push her away. I will lose her. So in that moment, the thing that came to me to do was, and then I I filed that away as a strategy later on for using later in class and other situations, but I turned to the rest of the class. It was a pretty diverse class. And I turned to them because it's an intercultural class. People who are interested tend to take that. I said, what do you think about that? You know, Kitty has this question and, and what would you all, so I turned it over to them and through the drawing the entire class in, we sort of worked through why it's important to ha have that multicultural representation in the U.S. that we are in today. And what my takeaway from that is bias can come in very obvious ways where you have to tackle it head on. But it can also come in ways where we have to be very careful in how we work with our students because uh, they're not coming from a place of malice. So I'll, I'll stop with that story. I've talked enough and I'll, I'll turn it over to my other colleague. Um, it, Min Jung, are you going to go next? Or? I, think, I think Monique was going to... Monique was going to go next? Okay. Yes, I I'm think happy so. to go next. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to go next. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Barton. Um, I think I'll just start from a place of personal introspection um, because as we did our prep session for uh, today's discussion, it, it really got me to thinking about and, and 
and maybe back up a little bit. So I'm an advertising and PR professor at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I'm new to faculty. I've been on faculty for about a year and a half now. I came from 20 years in industry. And I, my most recent assignment was in leading communication strategy for the largest school district in the state of Nebraska. But in personal introspection, I attended a small private college uh, in Fremont, Nebraska, then called Midland Lutheran, now called Midland University. It's grown since then. But there were about 1,200 students on campus and uh, specifically about 30 African-American students on campus. And one of the things that was a revelation to me as I interacted with some of my peers, you know, even having set foot on a college campus as a first gen student, um, and then also just learning to navigate college culture was that I was meeting and interacting with peers who had never seen a minority in real life ever in life. And some of these people were coming from small town communities like Humphrey, Nebraska, or Minden, or you know places where maybe the population was 800 and they knew everyone in their town. And, and, and one of the things that I learned as I started to make friends with peers is that we just really have to be open to listening and asking questions uh, with one another. The more you build trust and relationship with one another, the more um, comfortable I think I started to feel with some of my peers in the journalism college about just asking questions about things that have to do with cultural differences or even the music you listen to or how you might wear your hair or just very trivial kinds of topics, but really building that trust enough to want to learn about somebody who is from a culture different from yours. And so fast forward to me setting foot in a classroom as a full-time college professor here at the University of Nebraska. Um, there are similar instances where some of my students um, likewise have never in person uh, met a person of color. They have only seen a person of color on TV, which is extraordinary to me, especially uh, in today's day and age, but this is a reality for some of them. And so I'm very cognizant about how I show up in the classroom. I'm cognizant of purposefully looking for guest speakers and professionals from various different um, cultures and backgrounds to be able to bring to the classroom in front of my students to allow them to understand that the industry that they're interested in particularly pursuing um, has an array of various cultural uh, cultures and kinds of people in diverse perspectives who are making significant contributions to it. Um, and in addition to that, I would just echo Dr. Barton's sentiment around when we run into situations in the classroom that challenge us to take really a worldview around how we need to be very sensitive to considering cultural differences, cultural sensitivities, uh, especially in these in in these um, uh, really junior level um, advertising PR classrooms where students may be doing things like putting together advertising campaigns and and really really asking tough questions about how those campaigns are going to be received by the target audiences. Have we done enough due diligence on the research side? Uh, have we potentially um, focus group tested some of our messaging, some of our visuals to people from the cultural groups that we're potentially looking to represent and some of those um, assets and collateral that we're creating uh, so that we don't potentially inadvertently offend or come across as culturally ignorant or insensitive. Great, thank you, Monique. Um, so I get, we'll turn it over to Minjong. Uh, thank you, Dean, and thank you, Monique. Um, thank you for having me uh, in the session. When I was uh, approached to be part of the panel today, I was a bit reluctant at first because I didn't, I don't ever consider myself as an authority 
on this topic, uh, but I decided to take this as an opportunity to better educate myself to learn more about this topic. So, um, in, initially, when we, the panelists, um, Dean and Tina, got together to talk about the direction of this panel a few days ago, we were talking about how you know biases could affect the way that, that we carry ourselves, so how we are evaluated, and how we could actually be a voice of activists in the classroom to educate our st students uh, to be better citizens. Uh, when I was doing research to learn more about this topic in preparation for this panel, I actually um, learned a lot more, um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Uh, there are um, student-specific biases that professors and teachers can uh, address in the classroom, but there are also some biases that professors tend to carry, teachers carry in the classroom that really affect the classroom dynamic and the climate. So I've decided actually to focus today's my, 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 my talk based on um, in how as a professor to evaluate and lead the classroom climate um, to avoid our, you know, negative effects um, because of our un unconscious and conscious biases. So biases are often unconscious and instantaneous and trigger automatic decision making uh, for cognitive biases, such as, like, you know, as a social scientist myself and many of us who are present today are trained to like, combat um, cognitive biases through suspensions of our judgments uh, when the, and until the fact speaks for themselves. Uh, known and conscious biases might be mitigated with training, education, and self-reflection, but unconscious biases are very hard to be turned off due to their very nature being automatic and unconscious. So are we just imagining what effects unconscious biases by teachers have on the students of minority groups? Um, and is, I mean, I think there are profound evidence that supports that yes, there are detrimental effects uh, depending on how much uh, teacher biases uh, could have on the you know, student performance evaluations. Um, and um, so, you know, the, there are ample evidence that supports that. Uh, for example, the seminal work by D uh, 2004 um, for grading uh, shows that students' performance was significantly increased when they, they had the same race teachers. And it was not because the students magically were doing better work, but it was because a lot of times that the grade, grading involved some subjective judgments by the teacher. Also, the chance of uh, being reported for misbehaviors among preschool kids were drastically higher for kids of colors when their teachers were from different uh, ethnic backgrounds. Um, but I'm gonna talk about from uh, you know, a faculty uh, of color, female faculty of color, immigrant uh, perspective, and I'm gonna talk about Asian experiences in the, in the classroom, not only as a uh, you know, faculty, but also maybe uh, somebody who will be evaluated by a faculty of non-color um, um, you know, for, for my work, for my promotions and tenure efforts. Um, especially in higher education, students and faculty of ethnic, um, Asian ethnic backgrounds have been rendered invisible despite best differences in terms of socioeconomic, geographic, and educational profile. Asian students are typically viewed as a hom homogenous group. So refugees from Philippines, for example, uh, versus the third generation Japanese American are uh, as different as they could get. And yet Asian students and faculty are considered overrepresented populations in the academia that cannot be protected by affirmative action for college admissions or hiring. This discrimination within the minority groups in labeling some as underrepresented and others as overrepresented rendered Asian people voiceless in the discussion of racial injustice and racial biases in the classroom. So you might notice that maybe your Asian colleagues are pretty quiet when it comes to these issues of biases in the classroom and it's not because they don't have any voice, they don't have any views, but it's because um, we kind of feel lost where we belong. Um, and, and, and when it comes to international students, also like at Indiana University where I work as an associate professor, we have large populations of Asian um, uh, international students and Chinese students are my, my, um, majority. Some of the stereotypes that we often hold of these you know, Chinese students, they, they tend to be not a good team player with other racial groups, not a good leader when mixed with other racial group, or tend to commit uh, academic dishonesty, such as plagiarism and cheating on the exams, are some typical and not sometimes often not true stereotypes that they tend to be um, hold against. 
And these stereotypes uh, affect how these students' work are evaluated and mentored by their professors. So one example that I could show, share is that like, one instructor was something, a conversation that I overheard. One instructor singled out Chinese students and put them all in the front row during the final exam with the rationale that they tend to cheat. And another professor agreed and noted that it was such a great idea. So this is outrageous, but we all can agree that how many times we too unconsciously hold this view. And also for when it comes to tenure and promotion, I was told to work harder to prove my worth as a female faculty of color. Uh, so how can we mitigate these biases as a, as a professor in the classroom? So research shows that like, uh, teacher-facing interventions work uh, by leveraging some psychological mechanisms to combat uh, cognitive biases. So to create supportive and open classroom environment, we could recognize our own biases through reflections to write down what we hold against other racial, racial groups. So uh, myself, I often kind of do this exercise at the beginning of each semester and write down my own personal biases. To just because I'm a person of color does not mean that, that I don't hold like racial biases against other minority groups or uh, culturally my uh, majority groups. Um, and also, so that could be exercised through like a blind uh, grading exercise or not relying on volunteers for classroom discussions, but rather like, you know, uh, like, a raw, like a round robin kind of a type of, um, um, you know, practices where allow everybody to have a voice instead of relying on volunteerism. And then choose or use contents that demonstrate diversity in race, gender, sexuality, culture when teaching and showing that they experts they, they exist experts from diverse ethnic backgrounds um, and also when I make uh, conscious choices to really represent positive aspect of having diversity in our content I think that it really increased positive emotions among the students so they tend to feel good about being a part of that ethnic group and also getting to know the students better to build better empathy for students struggles they are very unique from um, from my experiences. But personally, this political environment of like Black Lives Matter uh, have really made me feel liberated personally uh, to talk about racial issues um, because that's what's everybody's on mind. Um, so I wanna make sure that, that I may use this chance to talk about these issues in the classroom and especially September is the PISS Ethics Month. So when I teach PR um, research, I teach PR research to PR students I cannot not talk about Tuskegee syphilis studies, for example, um, and uh, I cannot not talk about why there is a lack of participation in COVID vaccine trials from minority populations and because it is profound distrust that they rightfully hold against authority, like police, government, and medical professionals, and there is a historical context that we all have to understand. So I try to kind of talk about this in the classroom, but also so by creating more supportive environment where students feel like that they can actually have a voice, I think is very important. So ultimately, I think the struggle is internal for me that I have to question myself, do I have the authority to speak about this issue just because I'm a person of color? I don't feel like that I could do that, like especially when I'm faced with African-American students in the classroom, for example. But do I have expertise and motivation to care about this issue and do something about this issue, right? Do I have enough motivation? Now also, do we have policies in place that can foster accountability in us to actively do something about this, right? I think it goes beyond the individual effort to do something about this in the classroom, but at the institutional level, do we have a policy? So maybe this is a topic for another panel, but I just wanted to kind of bring this up and then with that, I wanna conclude what I have to say. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Just a reminder that if you have questions, you can please enter them into the chat screen and we're happy to ask them. Uh, so uh, I do have a couple of questions for you all. Um, how do you effectively handle that one naysayer voice? I know, Dr. Badan, you had said something earlier about how you handle the one student. But what about the, so I guess a couple things, what about the individuals who either don't think it necessarily applies to them, that they're not biased, that they're better than, than others at discerning their bias? How do you handle um, any sort of comeback in the classroom or even just sort of apathy like this doesn't really apply to me? And then we can start with whoever wants to jump in. If Anjala, if you want to take off your sure, yeah. 
Okay, I was just unmuting myself. Yeah, um, well, I think it comes in, in some different ways. I think apathy, the, I'll start with that one, where I get a sense of, um, um, yeah, the culture stuff doesn't really apply to me. I don't need to think about it. But, you know, I think uh, what, what um, you know, Minjong, you just said, when you, when you are transparent with your students and I, at least for me personally I have to consider that you know like I'm, a, I'm a, a woman of color teacher and I'm an immigrant as well uh, in the classroom um, I have to make it very clear that this applies to everybody you know just like you said you know you could be any color but this thing called prejudice and bias uh, comes in many different forms and not just in one form so my approach and you is always to create that climate that you said it's it's the kind of climate that we gradually create in a classroom over the course of the semester and it doesn't happen right away but it's about building that you know from the get-go it's like how you talk about these issues is to first get us get the temperature of the Every, every class is unique. So you get that temperature of, okay, who are, who are the people in this class? What kind of a community do we have? And based on that is, you know, is, is how I proceed in terms of being able to get everybody on board saying, you know, if I, for instance, have a, a, a more diverse class, I'll talk about these issues a little differently than, for example, if I have a less diverse class in terms of pulling people into the conversation. So it's like different things in different situations, but it's, it's keeping, um, uh, it's sort of having a sense of in this classroom and where do they seem to be coming from and then based on that what do I need to do to bring them all on board I, I'm, I don't know if it sounds too vague but I can't think of any one specific example but this is my overall approach from my experience I think um, like so like in order to create legitimate environment where we can talk about these issues and combat like you know some uh, apathy issues from certain students I think we all have to try to connect the conversations with the content that we are trying to teach. So um, at the beginning of a semester, always I begin the conversations with the perceptions in research and how biases affect the way that, that we perceive the reality. And just having this little video clip and having a conversations about that we all come from different perspectives and our interpretations of reality is affected by our perceptions. So just having this little exercise at the beginning of the semester tends to really kind of open up the environment where stu students feel like, yes, we can actually recognize the differences in perspective and pe different people's perspective do contribute to the overall uh, conversations. So I think it is very difficult to actually have like, you know, very like um, aggressive, sometimes um, um, very competitive students um, questioning the the merits of you know having a talk you know having talk conversations about uh, importance of diversity for example in our culture um, but ultimately when we connect this to the content they're trying to teach and the merit of having that view I think that they maybe they will digest that better <laughs> Can I just jump in real quick and add to that what you just said also, you know, it just reminds me of the, the and Dean, you're probably familiar, very familiar with this because you wrote it, but, uh, you know, the, the, the Commission for um, Education and Public Relations, the CPRE, the study showed uh, this last survey that, you know, students are not um, don't seem to have the skills, uh, attitude, and knowledge regarding diversity and inclusion that are that practitioners and those who are employing are asking for. They want these skills in students, but they're not seeing them, uh, you know, at, it, in the people who are applying for jobs. So, you know, as you said, Min Jung, if you can share something like that in the classroom and tell people, you know what, this is what the research is showing and this is very current. If you want a job, you need to be, you know, this is not just a, something nice that you do. It's just, this is just, just you just gotta get with it, you know, so I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I, I, I Oh, I thought I heard an echo, sorry. Uh, I would just piggyback off of uh, some of those thought processes. I mean, and I would also add that technology can be our friend when we run into some of these difficult conversations where, I mean, we're trying to make sure that we're governing our classrooms, that we're facilitators, and that we're helping our students know what to think about and what kinds of skills they need to be equipped with. 
I, I don't know that I ever feel like I have a personal obligation to intentionally try and change someone's personal opinion or take on their individual preconceived notions. But we are in an environment in the college classroom where we're working with young adults and we're helping to um, we're helping to equip them to conduct critical analysis and to be able to problem solve and to be able to think about different perspectives when they're approaching some of those problems. So I say technology can be our friend because we never want to be in a classroom where things run off the rails, right? Especially if you know you have somebody who's very passionate with a very passionate opinion. And um, this conversation specifically reminds me of uh, right after the most recent presidential election, I was at a school district it, every single high school we had seven in that school district we had high schoolers on polarized viewpoints with regard to how the presidential election turned out and we had them all actively planning walkouts which can become a safety issue and so we had to take that as administrators as an opportunity to educate these 14 to 18 some 19 year old students about the civic engagement process, about their First Amendment rights, about how to put together a peaceful protest, because it was clear we weren't going to stop them from putting together a protest, but we wanted to make sure that we kept them safe. And one of the things we did at a uh, one specific um, high school in particular was, I mean, the tone of the entire school district was tense. You could feel it just walking in, the way that the students were interacting with um, the teachers, the way that the way that they were interacting with each other, um, but we put we took the an, an entire school day and just turned it into a, a, a grade by grade assembly. And what we did was allow the students to using technology, using technology, so it didn't become a shouting match. Um, but we allowed them to do what they do all the time: text. And so they text using a tool that allowed their feelings to go on a screen and for a conversation to be led and navigated through administration. So it was in a safe environment, more of a control environment, but it gave students the opportunity to do what they wanted to do, express what they were feeling and get it out in the open and have a conversation about it instead of holding it in or you know, uh, feeling this, this aura of tension amongst each other. So I think we can use technology in our classrooms as well. I use tools like Padlet to help guide conversations and it helps students feel safer too that if they're able to put some of their thoughts in writing into a place where they don't have to be connected to them directly, but it's more of an um, anonymous way to do that, we can guide the conversation that way and, and allow some of those thoughts and opinions to be explored and discussed in a safe manner. Um, uh, Farmer, can you maybe just give a little more insight into, I don't know a lot of people use Padlet, um, but maybe just give us a little insight into how you do that and, and what that is. Sure. So Padlet is, it's Padlet, I believe it's Padlet.com, but it, it is an online tool that where you can create different templates and you can pre-stage them with questions. So I might put a question on one Padlet that is, what are you wondering about after the most recent lectures and reading? The next one might be, um, what, what is most confusing to you? or what concerns you the most. You know, you just guide the conversation and then it lets students either pre-populate it before class or they do it at the beginning of class. And I use what they tell me they wanna talk about to facilitate that in-classroom conversation. Um, the other example I gave you where we had the high school, the, it was it's the largest high school in the state at the time, I think 2,600 students. So when we went grade by grade, and we invited the media to that as well because they were aware because students were calling TV stations saying we're walking out today at this time. So it became, you know, interest to the public. Um, and so we invited the media in and we had these conversations with students through that was poll everywhere, which is another interactive online tool. But it really, I mean, it, it really did allow the students to have that conversation in a safe space where they could share their questions and their frustrations anonymously and have those facilitated by administrators who could then help guide and educate concurrently. Okay, great. 
wish that you had to drive conversations about race in the classroom? Is there anything that you particularly like, or is there any that that we should all think about how to fill? That's a question for me, Dr. McCorkendale, or for the group? For anybody is fine. But for you, if you want to start, that's great. <laughs> What tools I wish I had, um, you know, some conversation prompters, maybe some how to toolkits would be helpful if there were any just to kind of help uh, preempt some of the situations we might run into in the classroom. I Arthur Page, um, the case studies that are housed in Arthur Page when we think about specific kinds of challenges that we run into in PR, um, there's there are a good handful of them that are very good in terms of um, conversation starters. Uh, one specifically that I use in my PR management and case studies class is um, the Roseanne uh, case study, When You Wish Upon a Star. It was Disney, ABC. And so just a quick snapshot that case study, uh, it involves the tweet that wrote the infamous tweet about Valerie Jarrett that Roseanne put on Twitter, I believe at like 1 a.m. in the morning that created this PR nightmare and firestorm for Disney and ABC, which we know ultimately um, that that ended up in the cancellation of the her show and cost, it was $60 million in people's jobs, essentially. And at the same time, you had the first um, African-American female president of ABC Entertainment who wakes up in the morning to, to this nightmare and um, really has to make a decision about not only what do we say about this, but what do we do about it? And, and as we know, that doesn't just impact that one female African-American first time president of this global um, entertainment company, but that person has to now also rely on having the backing and support of that board. And so a, a number of us all get impacted and we're in this tough situation when something like that happens around what, what do we say, what do we do, what are our values? And then there's money involved too. So difficult kinds of situations, real world situations that we can discuss and talk about in the classroom. But again, this is also a reminder that this is the industry that students are preparing to go into and we're helping them have some of those real world conversations through case study before they potentially end up on a team that is faced with a challenge like this. So I think Arthur Page has some great case studies that could be brought into the classroom to help with some of these discussions as well. Okay, great. Barton, Dr. King, uh, Dr. Yeah. Barton. Oh, I, I was just going to say, uh, I mean, this has come up in other conversations and other, uh, you know, forums as well. I think it would be really helpful um, to have some sort of, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, Monique, you just mentioned about the Arthur Page uh, case studies um, that they have. What I do is, you know, when I'm teaching and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, to I, I'm looking for these things and I'm pulling from here and I'm pulling from there. It would be really helpful to have some kind of venue or place, um, maybe if IPR wants to do this, but have, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a book. A case study book would be great if somebody wanted to do it that focuses just on, you know, um, sort of case studies that are related to race or other forms of difference, but some sort of uh, effort to put these together that, that educators could go to in order to use in that classroom because race is sort of a, it's not a uniform topic. I mean, there's so many nuances and complications to how race can play out in a particular, you know, PR situation. So different kinds of, um, examples or case studies sort of pulled together, uh, would I think be helpful and, and, save us that time maybe that we're, we're looking for everywhere which is fine too but it's just good to have something together and just to add to that conversation i really think that is a great idea if we could have like a one you know like a area where we could actually go and access educational materials to have a conversation uh, personally, I use PISA, Silver Anvil databases, and particularly concerning about like community relations or global, inter like international uh, case uh, award-winning cases. Uh, one example that I use that were really um, that was really really popular among students was the um, was the Lance Armstrong. So right now it is just the Armstrong Foundation. Um, their their uh, amazing efforts to promote their uh, services to uh, Latino populations in America. And even when we're talking about American populations, we're talking about diverse cultural groups. 
And this campaign was really successfully dem demonstrating the importance of understanding uh, the culture within the U.S. Uh, and how, you know, successful campaigners would have to be aware of this, uh, you know, nuances and differences. Um, so I think the available resources are very helpful, like, you know, case studies from author page and the PISA Silva Envel Award databases. Uh, but if we could have like a one, like a portal where we could access to this conversation with some like guidance of how to lead that converse conversation, like the PISA, um, uh, case studies, I think they, they provide some kind of a worksheet with uh, guided questions, especially for ethics discussions. If we can have some sort of, um, you know, like a toolkit like that, I think that would be really, really helpful. And I think PR Council has a great, uh, they do the awards every year, the diversity awards, and they have a, a bunch of their award winning, um, you know, campaigns on diversity rates, you know, inclusion issues up there too. So that's another place I've gone to before. And uh, just a note from uh, our perspective, one, I uh, thanks Professor Farmer for sending the link to the case study competition. And that's open to everybody. Uh, we, we just put in the announcement for uh, the next year's competition, which is open. And a couple other, uh, other notes um, is we're also working on something called the Dialogue Project, which is USC, IPR, and ICF Next, where we have a series of case studies from companies uh, and also uh, uh, um, opinion pieces by uh, Jamie Diamond of J.P. Morgan Chase, Mary Barra, CEOs of big companies, along with research that talks about how difficult it is for people to have conversations. And when we surveyed people asking about what conversations are most difficult, I mean, it was close to about 70% of our respondents said race was up there. Uh, so, but another, and just one more thing is that we're announcing a lot, we haven't announced it yet, if you please don't tweet this out, we're also uh, announcing a Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and part of that is race, it's going to be race, LGBTQ+, men, and then intersectionality, and if, so we are going to have a section on case studies and everything, so if anyone has any a lot of research. We've been summarizing research that a lot of you have done. Um, but if anyone has any best practices or anything they do for conversation starters, we would love to uh, include that and credit you with, with doing it, of course. Um, all right. So uh, what conversations do you need? You know, it's really hard whenever we have any sort of, um, whenever we have any sort of discussions about this and what we should be teaching, there's only a finite period of time where we actually can teach these students, right? I mean, you have like limited hours and you have all these classes they have to take, but what conversations in the classroom should we be having that maybe we're not, or that you are especially valuable to have? For me, the ultimate, as I said um, in, in, in my talk, like the ultimate struggle is whether I feel like I have the legitimate voice to talk about these issues in the classroom with my students. And I think that that sort of us coming clean with our insecurities and like um, discomforts, but the importance of having this conversation, I think would be a good conversation starter. Um, it ultimately, maybe, uh, creating more inclusive and open environment where students could come out and share their insecurity and their discomfort about talking about this issue. Because I think we cannot assume that, that yeah, we know that this is an important topic, but then everybody who are present in the classroom feel that way and also feel comfortable talking about this. And that, you know, creating the value of this talk, um, like you know, creating the sense of uh, importance, I think, and then in, in like a sense of mission, um, the moral obligations. Uh, it's a very important topic to have. Well, Monique, where are you going to go? No, you go. You go ahead. I go. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, I was going to say that you know. I the curriculum really matters too, uh, and, and, and what content we're including in the curriculum. And when I say curriculum, I say throughout, you know, it's it, all the courses that we have uh, in the PR, you know, um, curriculum, what kind of work they're doing. I think somebody had a, a, a post on the chat here, the importance of bringing in uh, clients who are diverse for student run agencies. Uh, I was PRSA our PRSA chapter advisor for about 10 years. And um, we used to really make this effort to go out and you know work with diverse uh, clients who are in the community and I think that really makes a difference it helps students engage with um, 
with different uh, with different publics and different you know if you want to use the PR language, but diverse publics as well. Uh, we work with the you know we, we're a small college town, so we work with the Boys and Girls Club of America. We work with um, a group that we ha have. Uh, call for kids sake that works with like you know uh, orphanages out in Bangladesh and you know we just try to along with some of the others so this is an, an exposure to difference to a uh, different and that's the main thing and I think it's important to do this throughout the curriculum and not say this is the class where we're going to talk about you know diversity and race and it has to be organically woven throughout the curriculum and we've been also working on a curriculum where we brought in some electives that we feel are really important it doesn't necessarily have to be a PR class you can make these elective classes like, you know, communication across cultures, you know, and that students, when they take those kinds of classes, once we started having them, steered them towards those electives, we find that the change in the classroom, you know, people are, you know, those students are thinking a little differently when they come into their PR classrooms, when they are exposed to those other classes as well. So that's just something I wanted to share. Just to put back to what um, um, uh, Professor Barden said, I think also it's important to have a PR professionals face from diverse backgrounds when we are actually uh, exposing the students because they are going to go out and then they, especially students from minority backgrounds, it should be able to picture themselves in the picture and also educate our students um, you know, from uh, minority and ethnic backgrounds that it's not only their face that are represented in the industry. So in the classroom that I do make conscious efforts, because I said earlier, to actually show videos featuring, um, you know, um, like a VP of uh, ethnic, like, you know, like minority ethnic background, talking about issues of, like, you know, pub, um, public relations, for example. Uh, and I think that tend to really empower students of color. Yeah, I, I would just add also to Dr. Barton's comments about the importance of having uh, some of this content interwoven throughout the curriculum. But I think we have to aim for consistency in terms of that happening in every classroom, not only inside of classrooms where the professor happens to be a person of color. It, it, that is also something that sometimes makes me somewhat apprehensive, obviously being a new um, professor and I'm walking into these classrooms where sometimes I mean I'm the only person of color and I'm the I'm the student's professor um, but now I'm the I'm the professor who wants to have all the conversations about race relations that's you know that puts you that puts me in this weird position as well and so I think we definitely have to have the support um, from the top and and all across um, the faculty inside of our college and that has to do with what the how the curriculum is designed, um, and I know that's that's one of the discussions we've been having in the College of Journalism Mass Communications. One thing we did over the summer as a fact, faculty collectively is got engaged in a book club discussion, and so we all went, read White Privilege, and we had about four or five sessions that was led by um, uh, uh, Trina Creighton, who's one of our um, professors in our college, but that did also kind of open this opportunity where we're starting to have an ongoing discussion amongst our faculty, um, which is kind of where you get the ball rolling. You also have to have, obviously, that support from the dean level to be able to do that consistently and, and, and be able to move the needle. Um, but I, I would also say one of the conversations that we probably should be having in PR classrooms that I'm not sure if we are having, and this is right off the heels of uh, yesterday's uh, PRSA announcement uh, about um, promoting civil, sorry, promoting civility in public discourse. A lot of times, especially when I'm thinking about our younger generation, um, some of the conversations that I see in social media when, where people can be faceless are appalling. And so really having conversations about how we conduct ourselves in social, how we're all real people behind um, behind the screens and the shields that we're using. Uh, maybe just a little bit more conversations about what that means in terms of, you know, even the challenges that PR people face who are sometimes working for organizations where they have to be the voice creating the messages that are either leading some of these conversations or responding uh, to some of these issues and incidents as they happen with the ebbs and flows of our climate in, in our current society across our nation. So I think we need to start having those conversations if we're not right now. 
So I want to ask a question, and I hope I don't get in trouble for asking it. And uh, Professor Oso and his, uh, uh, what he posted in the chat is kind of inspirational. Has anyone, and I don't want to put the uh, panels on the spot, but uh, feel free to jump in or if you're comfortable, that's fine. But has anyone thought about how they're going to talk to their students following the election, regardless of what happens and who wins. I mean, just recalling, you know, a few years ago, it's such a contentious part, but race plays a huge part in this upcoming presidential election, regardless of what sides may say. Has anyone thought about this, like how you're going to approach this discussion in the classroom? Because there's going to be some people who are excited and some who are disappointed. That the topic is so, um, you know, challenging from a polarization standpoint. So I just wanted to get your thoughts. And if you're not comfortable, say, I'm ignoring you. You know, which not uh, the first time I've heard that today. So there you go. <laughs> well, oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead here. I won't say I have a plan yet or a clear plan. I'm sort of, you know, because so much keeps changing every day, although there is an overall picture. Uh, again, for me, it's the temperature of the classroom issue, and I'm going to see how things come up and um, it's going to be really important as we get closer to that time to make sure that the classroom is a space where we can have these conversations as safely as possible and and letting students know that this is very charged and if you have a viewpoint or something as they come up to be able to talk about things in a manner respect for people and their differences is not sacrificed and and, and sort of saying that over and over in the classroom just and, and saying it's important you know it, and polarize and explaining what polarization is and how it happens and i think once people start understanding the phenomenon instead of just we're polarized you know why we say things the way we do you know and that is some work that's already i've been doing i guess you know in the classroom since we're heading towards that it's about setting up a way of talking about it so that when we get to that point uh we have that background work done about um, these issues so that's my approach to it I haven't really thought about the possibility of the, the result of the elections other ways than that I desire <laughs> to be. Well, um, so maybe I'm in denial or really hoping for the best, but uh, not this election, but last uh, previous elections, what I've been doing, and also I try just not to stay away too much uh, from the content that I am supposed to teach when I'm trying to have this conversation. So since I primarily teach public relations research, and planning. I use I use some examples of the you know uh, uh, the candidates uh, poll, like how they, they actually question certain wordings to obtain the data that they are trying to obtain. So like the biases in the the wording, some uh, like intentional uh, measurement errors that they're creating uh, to find supports for their arguments, etc. So. Uh, it's not really about the candidates per se, but rather the way that they use research to advance their agenda, that, that I try to have their conversations in the classroom. Um, because I think that's just sort of the, the nature of the classroom. And then if I sway a tool away from the focus, then that will lose the legitimacy <laughs> in bringing up this content, other than the fact that we all want to talk, all want to talk about it. Yeah, Dr. McCorkendale, I cannot say that I've thought about it specifically. I, it, it is, uh, it's concerning because, I mean, often I think what we find when our students are focused on something other than our agenda for the day is that they're, they're not focused on that agenda for the day. So I, I would say my habit is to really try and figure out how to bring those real world situations into the classroom in a way where we can dissect them uh, using some kind of PR framework that's relevant, but it's you have put that on my radar now that's something I should think about um, because we will be at the last few weeks of our semester once um, the the election concludes. And so it makes me wonder about what the temperature of those cohorts are going to be when we get there. And I would just also jump in real quick and say, you know, so many of our of us are teaching remotely now, you know, through Zoom and all of that. So that would be an added layer over there on how these issues get addressed. Because as we said, you know, when people, um, you know, are are on screen like this, they they just sort of say things that they wouldn't face to face. So we have to. I think that would be something else to keep in mind as well. 
point. Uh, so I think we have, uh, not me, but uh, the other three have 30 seconds if you want to give a summary or anything you want to conclude with or, you know, as we walk away from the conversation. Uh, so uh, Dr. King, we'll start with you. Yeah, first of all, I, uh, my apologies for making this clicking noise. Uh, my <laughs> earring was uh, right there. And then, of course, I was, I was not hearing that. Uh, so I, my apologies for distracting the listeners from the conversation. Um, but I, I was you know, able to remove that. Uh, this is a, such an important topic that I feel like we just should motivate ourselves to educate ourselves more. Hopefully that they will have more resources to put together for us to have like a unified portal where it makes it easier for us to approach this topic with our students. But as I said at the beginning, um, I think it, it's, we should also kind of uh, do a self-reflection to, to think about wh like where we come from, like you know, where we are in terms of having our own biases uh, affecting the way that, that we actually lead the conversations with our students and uh, also like you know, mentoring and teaching our students. So um, yeah, but I've learned a, a great deal from other panelists and also this conversation just make me wanna know more about this. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Professor Farmer. Yeah, so again, thank you so much for the opportunity to join the conversation. I would just end again with, a no, in no way do I purport to be an expert in this arena, but the conversation um, with my colleagues on the panel here this afternoon, I think has been helpful for me. And then I've been also watching the chat and sneaking every few minutes and cutting and pasting resources <laughs> that I can keep and go back to later. But uh, Dr. McCorkendale, I think it would be wonderful if we have a place to continue this conversation. And so I don't know potentially what that looks like if there's already a community um, out on IPR where that's happening. But, you know, we had however many people register this afternoon, 140 of us. And so if there was some way to maintain connectivity as we come up with ideas, approaches, prompts, maybe toolkits, um, that would be incredibly helpful and um, a great support moving forward. Thank you. Dr. Barton? Well, I absolutely second everything uh, that, you know, my colleagues just said about uh, what we need, more resources and so on. But I just want to sort of say also a point that was brought earlier up is, um, you know, the need to work on ourselves. And I think this was also just mentioned, but diversity is everybody's responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of a few people to do this work, talking about race, talking about all the other kinds of differences in, whether it's in a PR classroom, whether it's in a general conversation, if it's in a hallway, it, it's ongoing, it's all the time. It needs to be organic and woven throughout the curriculum. And I would also say, if you don't have a class within the PR curriculum that, you know, uh, is, is focused on these issues, direct your students to classes that are available on campus that will, get, you know, because someone on chat here wrote that, you know, they didn't get anything out of their PR curriculum that they were really looking for related to race and equity. Uh, I think it was, um, um, but anyway, um, but uh, there are classes out there and maybe other programs and it's okay to direct students towards those classes. Well, thank you all to our three marvelous participants today, panelists for joining us and giving us all the great insight. Uh, we are working on October. We already have November set for the Race in the PR Classroom series. So please check it out. It's on the IPR website. And there is a AEJMC PRSA Educators Academy panel this afternoon at uh, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern. Uh, and hope to see you all there and have a great uh, Thursday. I forgot what today is, but have a good one. Thank you all. Bye. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest of the week.